Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves, who just to deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we can delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, our refuge and strength, the author of all godliness, by your grace hear the prayers of your church, Grant that those things which we ask in faith we may receive through your bountiful mercy, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Habakkuk, the first chapter. Habakkuk cries out for God's help and direction. He cries out in despair and helplessness as he puts his trust in the Lord. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. Habakkuk stands at the listening post to be quiet and listen for the Lord's answer. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Habakkuk hears the Lord's answer. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, Wait for it, it will surely come, it will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up, it is not upright within him, 
but the righteous shall live by his faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is recorded in 2 Timothy, the first chapter. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers, night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me, in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Hallelujah, Lord, to whom shall we go? The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 17th chapter. And he said to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he rather not say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Together and proudly we profess the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we invite our children to come forward. Well, hey guys, how are you doing? Good. Good? Well, you sound a little tired this morning. You're tired? Yes. Yeah? Okay, well, I'm sorry. Well, can, can you say good like you're not tired? Ready? Go. Good. All right, well, we'll see. All right. Well, I got a question for you. Uh, what is faith? Oh, I stumped you already. Woo. <laughs> Any ideas what, what faith is? What's faith? Is faith something like trust? Maybe faith is trusting in God, right? As, as we're Christians, we, we trust in God, and, uh, and that, that's what faith is. Now, here's a question. Can a baby have faith? Does a baby trust in people? Yes. Who, who does a baby trust in? Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, their parents, right? And how do they, how do they trust their parents? How do they have faith in their parents? Oh, yeah, so, so God kind of put it in them that they shouldn't be afraid of their parents. They should trust them. Okay, yeah. So they can have dinner. Yeah, so they can eat, right? Do babies cry a lot? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They cry a lot. You know that? All right. Well, why do babies cry? Maybe one of the reasons they want to eat, what, what's maybe another reason that they cry? All right, what do you think? Because they're maybe tired. Yeah, maybe they're tired and they just want to sleep and they don't know how to sleep yet. What do you think? They don't get their way. Yeah, maybe they don't want to uh, be in church or something, right? What, what else? They're yeah, they're bored. Okay, yeah. What, what else? Their diaper's full. Yeah, their diaper's full, right? And, and you think uh, if they had these problems um, and they didn't have trust that their parents might fix them, maybe they wouldn't cry. They would just kind of sit there and be sad. But they cry because they're trying to get their parents' attention and saying, hey, guys, I have a problem. I need you to fix it, Right? They have trust that their parents are going to take care of them. Now here's a question. When do we get our faith in God? When do we trust God? Yeah, when we get baptized right there. We got the baptismal font, right? And we see babies get baptized in there. And that's when the Holy Spirit is putting that faith in them, that trust, to not only trust their parents, but to also trust God. So what does it look like when we trust God? Why do we trust God? Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, he's our father. Yeah, that's a good answer. What, do you, what were you going to say? Um, because we want to obey him. Yeah, because we want to obey him, we, right? We want, to, we want to be good for God, okay? Yeah. Yeah, because we, we know that he loves us. When we, when we trust God, what are we trusting that he'll do for us? What is God going to do for us? And what does he do for us? What, what did Jesus do for us? Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, he died on the cross. And, and because he died on the cross, he forgives us our sins. And we trust that he forgives us our sins, right? What else did Jesus do for us? He told us that he'll come back again as soon as the whole world hurts. Yeah, he's going to come back again, right? And he's going to fix everything. And that takes a lot of trust sometimes, too, because sometimes we hear scary stories or some, some bad things happen or sometimes we get sick. You know, things aren't perfect in this world, right? There's a lot of things that need fixing, right? 
But we know that Jesus is going to come back and he's going to fix everything. And we trust that he'll do it. So our faith, which is that trust, it's really just waiting and watching what God is going to do. That's what that is. And that's pretty cool. And it's pretty cool that God gives that to us. So would you guys please pray with me? And you can repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for, for giving me faith. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for sending Jesus. And thank you that we can trust in you. Thank you that we can trust in you. In your name we pray. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, thanks guys. Here guys. Would you please pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for gathering us here this morning around your word and your teaching. We ask that you'd send your Holy Spirit to be with us this morning as we hear your word and learn from it. That we would grow in faith and grow in knowledge of those promises and purposes you have for us. Pray all this in the name of your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, this, uh, this gospel passage where Jesus is teaching yet again about discipleship and faith uh, it's, it's a passage of many parts. Uh, it might be a little difficult to, to parse out and see just how it's connected. Jesus starts by talking about how we live in a world full of temptations, and those temptations are unavoidable. They're inevitable. And then he goes on talking about how we should forgive each other just constantly, and that, that faith is, well, when it's doing the right thing, it's commanding trees to obey. And then it goes on, and the last thing he talks about is a servant that doesn't get special treatment just for doing his job. And it's a little like, Jesus, what are you doing here? What are you trying to, to talk through? But I think when we look at this passage, instead of looking at all those parts, probably the most interesting and eye-catching thing is the fact that all it takes is a mustard seed faith to tell a, a tree to be uprooted and go throw itself in the sea. It's like, well, what's that about? And how do I get faith like that? i, I got to be honest with you, when I hear something like that, and when I hear people talk about that, it kind of reminds me of a, a certain scene from Star Wars. And, and so I want to uh, compare that scene for you and, and show you that scene, and then we'll talk about, well, what are some ways, things that we might get right, and what are some things that it doesn't quite get right? And what can we learn about faith? Now, now, just a quick disclaimer before we watch that clip. Um, I, I had a seminary professor uh, this, these last few years uh, who I learned a lot from. Uh, his name is Rev Rosso. And one of his classes, uh, the entire point was that Jesus, who created the world, Jesus' gospel is, is so powerful and potent and, and just gets in, into the entirety of creation that the gospel can't help but just be permeated in all our stories and everything we do. And so his point was that in every story, you, you can see either a shadow of the gospel, maybe a metaphor of what Jesus has done for us, or, or maybe just it shows our need for a Savior. And so when we watch this clip, that's what I want to do for you, is, is talk about, well, how is it showing us a shadow of Jesus, or how is it showing us a shadow or a metaphor of his word? And so, uh, I guess without further ado, uh, here's a Star Wars clip. But actually, really quick, uh, can you hit pause? If you've not seen Star Wars, here is a quick uh, just context for you. Uh, this boy named Luke Skywalker, he's looking for this uh, Jedi master, this little green alien named Yoda, right? And he goes to this, this uh, kind of remote planet, and he crash lands, and now his ship is stuck. It's stuck in, in the sea, uh, in, in this pond or this lake or whatever. And, and so uh, he's been training with Yoda, but now he's trying to get his ship out. So there's a setup for you. Roll clip. Uh-oh, we're getting the, from the back. Uh, and in and, and hopes that it'll still come up, he can still keep on trying. Uh, one other thing that might be helpful to know uh, is that the, the kind of religion in this, in this movie is uh, what they call the Force. Uh, it's kind of this mystical energy sort of thing that uh, uh, can, can move things, and, and you, when you're more in tune with it, 
uh, it can do things for you and so forth. So, so that's where the faith aspect is going to come from. Oh, keep on talking? Okay, let's see here. Uh, all right, all right. Well, if we still get the clip, uh, we'll still roll it uh, and just start rolling it if it, if it starts. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start to spoil it for you just so we can move on here in case we don't get it. Uh, wh what happens is uh, this, this boy named Luke, uh, who's training to be this, this Jedi, uh, he, he you know, comes up to Yoda and, and you know, uh, hey, I need to get my ship out of this, this lake. You know, what's going on? And uh, so Yoda says, well, you know, you've got to try and tap into the Force. And, of course, I'm, not, I'm just summarizing, but uh, you've got to try and tap into that, and uh, you get it out. And, and so Luke says, well, I'll try. And, and that's where the, maybe the famous quote comes from. Uh, you know, Yoda says, uh, do or do not, there is no try, right? Uh, and there's some high expectations there for what's going on. And so, uh, you know, Luke uh, faces where his ship has sunk into that lake, and uh, he starts to try to pull it out, you know, uh, using his mind, tapping into the force here. And, and it moves a little bit, but it doesn't really budge. You know, it, it's, it's still stuck. And so uh, he comes back, and, and he gives up, and he com comes up to Yoda, and he says, I can't do it. And you can tell that he's been trying really hard, and he's out of breath, and, and he says, I can't do it. And uh, he says, it's just too big. And, and Yoda, maybe you know if you've seen this movie, he's this uh, really small guy, about that, that, that tall in, in, uh, in total. And, and so uh, Yoda says, hey, I could do this. You know, it's not about the size of the object. Size matters not. And, and so it's not his size nor the size of the task at hand that's important. And, and so uh, Luke says, no, no way, it's impossible. And he, and he kind of... Uh, stomps off as a, as a teenager would uh, and goes and sits down and mopes a little bit. And, uh, and so Yoda, while he's off, uh, walks up to the lake and uh, moves the, the big X-wing uh, starship. And the, and the X-wing just floats uh, and, and comes onto dry land. And, and, and so that, that's the scene that I wanted to show you. And, and so, uh, and, you know, of course, Luke can't believe it. And, and uh, he, he learns a, a good lesson in, well, in, in faith and discipleship, I guess you could say, if you put uh, churchy words on it. And so I want to draw some connections here. Uh, you know, of course, Yoda says at first, uh, do or do not, there is no try. Uh, and, and I think both of these scenes are, are pretty similar uh, into what the disciple is learning from Jesus, uh, what Luke is learning from this Jedi Master Yoda, and, and what we as disciples of Jesus learn and what our experience is as disciples. Uh, and you know, of course, the obvious comparison between these might be uh, the, the, the comparison of the floating X-wings and the telling the tree to go and, you know, jump in a lake, right? Uh, and, and we might say, just like Luke, how, how do I get that? How do I attain the level of faith needed to do something like that? that that's amazing. And so, maybe that first connection we make is where Yoda says, do or do not, there is no try. And if, when, when Jesus talks, boy, he's been giving us some high expectations of discipleship, hasn't he? Just like there is a high expectation that this boy, Luke, would be able to do this monumental task. You know, we've kind of done an accidental sermon series these last maybe month or so, where uh, all these accounts keep on coming up where Jesus is teaching, and he's teaching about discipleship what it means to be a disciple. And there hasn't been a whole lot of uh, gospel, you could say. It's just been, oh, I mean, do we have the clip here? I hear R2-D2. We can still roll it if, it if it would help. Do we have it? All right, we're just teasing me now. All right. Wait, okay. Clearly the computer needs coffee this morning. All right, well, I'll keep on going, and if you get it, just let it start playing. So, uh, maybe by the end of the sermon. We got it? There we go, awesome. Uh-oh.
<laughs> Up the sound. We'll never get it out now. So certain are you. Uh-oh. Able to hear it very well. There you go. That long for it. <laughs> well, uh, if you weren't able to hear it very well, you're at least able to see uh, what I was talking about. Uh, and I, I was talking about how there's high expectations of the disciple, right? Uh, and how in that clip, you know, of course, the high expectation was that this this boy would be able to move uh, this this big star uh, star fighter, and and so uh, uh, there's high expectations. Uh, and the disciples, of course, they've been learning about these high expectations of discipleship from Jesus. And so have we. And Jesus starts this, this passage about talking how temptations in this world are inevitable. And the disciple is one who says no to those temptations and instead follows Jesus. And boy, that sounds like a high cost of discipleship. A high standard. And, and we also talk about how, how Jesus, he says that we must... We must repent and forgive 
daily, all the time, just constantly. And really, Jesus is telling us, how do you make it in a world where temptations are inevitable? It's constantly repenting of when you blow it and asking for forgiveness. And on the flip side, when somebody else blows it, constantly being receptive to their repentance and constantly giving him forgiveness. And so the disciples hear this and they say, are you kidding me? They've been listening to Jesus go on for chapters and chapters about discipleship and they finally say, Jesus, hold on, wait. We can't do that. Are you kidding us? It's, it's, it's impossible. It's too much. It's too big of a task. And maybe that's where we make our second connection because, of course, we saw Luke finally quits and says, I can't do it. And that, that's right where his teacher wanted him to the point where he was finally coming to terms with where he was and that's when he was finally trainable. And we could say the same thing. As disciples, that's where Jesus wants us. To stop trusting in our own abilities and to finally be broken enough to say, Jesus, I can't do it. And that's when Jesus says, I know. I know you can't do it. Maybe that's where we make our next connection because, you know, of course, Yoda teaches Luke, hey, it's not the size that counts. It's not the size of the task. It's not the size of you. It's not that that matters. And Jesus says the same thing. He says the problem is not the impossibility of the task and the problem is not the size of your faith. It doesn't matter if your faith is the size of a mustard seed. See, the goal is not to have a mustard seed faith. The goal is not to guilt you for having disobedient trees in your life. You know, I, I'll tell you, I've never told a tree to move anywhere and I've never had any mountains move as a result of my faith. That does not mean that Jesus is trying to guilt me because I don't have a big enough faith. See, the goal is to see exactly what a mustard seed faith is capable of. See, a mustard seed, you might know, is, is about the size of a freckle, if not much bigger. And it grows into a huge mustard tree. And I should have had a picture of a mustard tree up for you, but we could be here for another 20 minutes. Uh, but it's to see what that, what that kind of faith is capable of. See, what it's capable of is, is not necessarily floating X-wings or telling trees to go jump in a lake. But the seemingly impossible task that it does see is, is similar. See, and that's where maybe this teaching of Jesus is a little different from this scene in Star Wars. Well, it's different in many ways, but, but that's maybe where we can learn a little bit more about the faith. Because uh, unlike in Star Wars, faith for the Christian disciple is not a power that is found in you. It's not a virtue of the Christian disciple. See, you can't be so in tune with your faith that you can literally move mountains. That's not what Jesus is teaching. See, faith is not a power that you have, but it's utter dependence on God and His promises. That's what faith is. And that's why brokenness is so important. Finally learning it's not about you. It's about having the eyes of faith to see what God is doing, what, what mountains God is going to move. That's discipleship. Following Jesus and seeing what He is capable of. See, it's expecting God to work and to seek His will while we follow what He's doing. See, the kingdom of God is, is God's good will for us being done. See, being a disciple is trying to see what the kingdom is going to do next how the kingdom is going to sh be shaped and move next. See, faith expects God to work in the world and in our lives. Faith is just expecting it to happen and just being ready to watch God work. See, faith in our lives 
sees the impossible being done in our lives. And, and it, it, Jesus gives us the example of forgiving the unforgivable, right? And I'll tell you, sometimes it seems downright impossible to forgive someone. See, faith is not about moving things with your mind. It's about God redeeming what has been touched by sin and death in this world. Faith is not about remo- faith is about God removing the effects of sin and Satan in our lives. See, and, and God will do that in grand ways right now when we watch him work, but he'll do it completely when Jesus returns. See, faith is being able to do the seemingly impossible task of maybe forgiving a dad when he's left your family as a, as a child. Faith is loving someone who maybe violated you. Faith is caring for criminals, people who should not be forgiven. Faith, boy, faith sees just how God redeems death for his resurrection gospel. Folks, those are impossible things. And those are the mountains that need moving. And those are exactly the mountains and the trees that God moves in his kingdom and that we, with eyes of faith, see. But Jesus goes into his last part here where he says that faith is not about about being puffed up as Christians. See, faith in someone is not something to be admired. It's our job. It's the expectation of discipleship. See, it is what is normal in the kingdom of God. See, unlike how this Star Wars scene ends, with Luke realizing how much more he must do to grow, see, this passage that we read in Luke It's a passage of hope and promise. Jesus is not saying that you should feel guilty if you don't think your faith is strong enough. Jesus is promising you that he will make your faith stronger. This is a gospel promise. It's a promise that Jesus is in charge of your discipleship. That he is leading you. See, faith starts as small as a mustard seed, but it will grow big because of our king. Our king, whose kingdom also started small. In fact, it was so small that our king was coronated as a king on a cross, and he had 12 disciples who were scared and fleeing. A kingdom doesn't get much smaller. And fellow Christians, that kingdom, that kingdom is big. And it is on the move today. And that kingdom started small in you. And your job as a Christian is just to watch and see how God grows the kingdom and how God grows your faith in you. Brothers and sisters, have faith and watch God work in His name. Amen.
Father, we thank you for the gift of faith, and we ask, Lord, that you would uh, help us and not only to live by faith, but to give by faith as well, that the gifts that we give here, we know will be received well by you and will multiply for your kingdom, that your kingdom may grow and that our faith may grow as well. You've promised that in your gospel message uh, today and always, and we trust that that will happen. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said. Let us pray. Father in heaven, so many times our faith is as small as a mustard seed. And Father, so many times we as humans trust that smallness, believing somehow that someone else is called to do, not trusting you, that you will grow it for your kingdom. Today we take a step forward knowing that you will grow it for your kingdom. Not for our purposes, but for your purposes. Father, may that gospel message reach out to all around us, that they may uh, truly hear your message and come to know you in faith, even as we have done that. We, Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank you for those who are celebrating birthdays. Shirley Presley, uh, Carol Amacher, uh, Jerry Gersmall, Dan Hansen, Norm Jensen, and Lenora Fletcher. We pray, Lord, that you would be with them and grant them your uh, continued blessing as they grow closer to you and as they live their lives for you. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank you for the gift of marriage that you've granted your church. We pray, Lord, that we would continue to uh, live in that grace and in that mercy. We continue to honor you in our marriages. Today we are thankful for a marriage with Randy and Stacy Hahn, Dave and Bonnie Max, uh, Marks, uh, Jeremy and Molly Krakow, Mark and Don Roosh, David and Teresa Powers, Ron and Sue Bushman, uh, Dane and Deb Conover, Bill and Bev Steinke, Scott and Jessica Stolfit, Trevor and Tracy Olofsson, Larry and Linda Hefner, Ryan and Haley O'Connor, and John and Kara Lee. Father, that you would be evident in their lives as they live with each other and evident to the world as they give uh, witness to you. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for those in need of your healing, in need of your encouragement and love and that we as your people might reach out to these folks as well. Don, we pray for Don Chillinger undergoing um, uh, cancer treatment here in the coming months, that you'd be with him and give him courage and uh, blessing in that treatment. We pray for Doris Havlick and Jackie Gums, uh, both hospitalized and being released. We pray for continued uh, recovery for Jeff Ringer from knee surgery, and we pray, Lord, that you'd be with Caitlin Moraski as she undergoes surgery here on Monday as well. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we also pray for uh, those who have uh, lost loved ones. Knowing that they've gone into heaven, we pray for the family of Carl Selly, Reverend Carl Selly, uh, Janice uh, Bulbus, and... Uh, and Doug and Beverly Hazelwood, all uh, members or friends of the congregation, and we pray, Lord, that you'd be with the families and that they might point to the gospel. Lord, in your mercy. All these things we bring before you, trust in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The May this true body and blood strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith and a life everlasting to part in his peace and his love. Amen. Thank the Lord and sing his. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and always. Amen.